Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gyne, and today we're talking about the rise of cryptocurrencies around the world. Cryptocurrencies have been in the news a lot lately. The first cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, is now worth nearly 66,000 Canadian dollars per coin, and early adopters of this new digital currency are now multimillionaires. And new cryptocurrencies are emerging, like Ethereum and the literally joke-started <laughs> cryptocurrency Dogecoin. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, there's even a product called non-fungible tokens, which are basically original digital images that are auctioned off for sometimes millions of dollars. This is all pretty confusing for people who are used to dealing with hard currency, walking into a physical branch of a bank or using investment products like mutual funds. Think of today's episode as a type of cryptocurrency 101. We're gonna be joined by our guest, Gavin Brown, to talk about the basics of Bitcoin uh, from the University of Liverpool. Thank you so much, Gavin, for joining me today. Um, now, let's start with the, the most simple thing. What is a Bitcoin and why should we care about it? Yeah, thanks very much for having me, Christine. I appreciate it. It's, um, I mean, Bitcoin has been around for, for just over 12 years now, so uh, relatively young in currency terms. Um, in terms of what it is, a lot of people struggle with this in terms of um, actually how we define it. A few people talk, talk about it as being a currency. Other, other people in other parts of the world obviously get quite unnerved by the fact that we even refer to it as a currency because it's not really backed by anyone in particular. So what we really see here is, is that uh, yourselves uh, based in Canada, obviously using the Canadian dollar and here in the UK with pound sterling. But generally speaking, we get comfort and credibility from that because it's backed by our central banks and our governments. The difference with Bitcoin is, is that it's not controlled by a nation state. It's not controlled by people. Instead, it's controlled by mathematical code, which has actually already been created. Now, a lot of people see um, that being quite attractive because obviously, you know, when we, you know, I've got pounds in my in my pocket at the moment, just a couple of pounds or whatever it might be. You know, we go through a COVID crisis, for instance, and I could see my central bank start to do quantitative easing, start to increase the amount of money in the overall economy. And that actually affects the value of my currency. The nice thing about something like a cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin is that that can't happen. It doesn't change with the changing economies or environments. And instead, it's relatively steady or indeed static in terms of its monetary policy. And a lot of people find, find, find refuge and find it quite attractive as an investment because of that. So, but where, where does a Bitcoin come from? You know, I've heard that uh, they generate, to, to generate a Bitcoin, it, <clears throat> it takes about as much electricity as it takes to run a small country. So, you know, where, where is this coming from and why is it taking so much electricity to create? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And certainly the carbon footprint of cryptocurrencies generally is, is very poor. Um, but with them being relatively new, I guess you might almost expect that from that, that type of technology. But, you know, what, what, we've, what we're in the situation is this. Let me almost describe to you perhaps the very first Bitcoins that were created. So in 2008, quarter three, 2008, Bitcoin was, was first theorized, first created and, and thought about by a, a pseudo anonymous person called Satoshi Nakamoto, who you may or may not talk about. But um, um, just three or four months later, on the 3rd of January 2009, so just towards the end of the financial crisis, uh, the very first Bitcoins were created. So the best way of thinking about them is this, is that they're effectively created, let's think about them on the cloud or on the internet or however you want to call it, and they're created in blocks. So every 10 minutes, a block of Bitcoins is created. Now, in that very first block, it's what's known as the Genesis block, for, for obvious reasons, uh, there were 50 Bitcoins inside that block. And what then happens is 10 minutes later, another 50 Bitcoins, 10 minutes after that, another 50 Bitcoins. And for the last 12 years, every 10 minutes, roughly, a new block of Bitcoins has been created. So it's almost a conveyor belt of digital currency creation. Yeah. Now, where does all that environmental kind of uh, sort of uh, disadvantage come from, though, is that what we say is this is obviously if we just gave away those Bitcoins, you would imagine that, you know, like anything, if you give it away, it's not got a value. What we see actually with something like Bitcoin is that actually to get those Bitcoins when they're first created or minted, if you like, is that people, communities or what we know as Bitcoin miners come along with their fantastic computers, big computer processors, and they try and solve a pre-described um, puzzle, a cryptographic puzzle. Think of it as a Sudoku or something like that. And if they're able to do so, they stand a chance of winning some or all of the Bitcoins inside the block. Now, that's what we call Bitcoin mining. That's one type of Bitcoin mining. And that's why it uses so much electricity. It's simply because that all these uh, Bitcoin miners globally are, are purchasing computer processing power. 
purchasing electricity. And obviously that has a big downward uh, sort of environmental effect as well. So really fascinating process and <laughs> incredibly complex. Um, let's yeah. just take a commercial break and then we'll get back into it. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're doing a special on Bitcoin and Cryptocurrency 101. We're here with Associate Professor Gavin Brown from the University of Liverpool. Um, now, Ms. Professor Brown, can you explain exactly for our viewers who, who may not know, where do you actually go um, to buy a Bitcoin and, and where do you sell it? You know, I've seen these, these Bitcoin vending machines in convenience stores. Uh, should I run in the other direction when I see those or, or, or where do I actually go to, to buy those, these, these, these products? Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent question, Christine. So, so typically, um, most people will use an exchange. So, um, like with anything that you wish to purchase uh, or sell, uh, whether it be stocks and shares, bonds, whatever it might be, or even you know gold or or anything like that. Um, typically, what we do is is you register with a, an exchange, a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, once you've done so, you, you normally then are taken through various uh, control measures, normally regulatory in nature. So, you've Sorry, normally got to. Sorry, just to stop you, got Professor Brown. Are these like a regular exchange that I would you? know have with my 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 regular bank or is it a different type of exchange entirely um it, it's it's normally not controlled by traditional banks shall we say um but it's it operates in exactly the same way so you open an account uh they check your identity and various things like that you have to go through uh, certain restrictions and uh, uh, extra questions and once you've done that you put in your payment details and then you're able to buy and sell like you can buy and sell any type of good or asset it's just that they're cryptocurrencies rather than stocks and shares and bonds and and these vending machines what would you tell people about those the type that you see in in shops yeah, I mean, they're becoming slightly more common now than they perhaps once were, uh, ATMs and things like that as well. Uh, the pricing of them tends not to be quite as competitive. Uh, so you're normally paying for the convenience physically there. Uh, but it also can be quite useful. You know, if you're in a, a foreign country, for instance, and you've got some some money that you want to quickly convert into Bitcoin and maybe send to f friends and family on the other side of the world, then it can be quite an, an efficient mechanism of getting it there more quickly. But typically, you'll normally get a more competitive price via the larger, more liquid exchanges. So if someone wanted to use a machine like that, what should they be looking for to make sure it's kind of le a legit one? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, this it all depends on that each of the different machines and softwares do actually work in a slightly different uh, sort of means. I mean, what I would what I would suggest is um, you perhaps want to send a small amount of currency first, make sure everything goes through correctly before you start using something regular. So like with any new type of software or service, probably just trial run it with a very small amount of money initially to make sure you're comfortable and that it's working OK before you start ramping it up. And use. But as I said, normally you'd be typically accessing via your mobile or via your laptop etc rather than using the physical machines in store good advice so once you have your bitcoin that you've purchased where do you actually keep it since i, I assume it's not in a regular bank and you don't keep it in your wallet where does it go um yeah there's a couple of alternatives really so the first one which most people do is leave them what's called on exchange uh which basically means once you've bought them you actually leave it in your account with the exchange that you're with the only problem is though is that many of these exchanges are either unregulated or often are subject to hacks and various problems which means your assets are at risk so Instead, as an alternative, you can actually use what's called cold storage, which means you can actually put your uh, Bitcoin on what's called the blockchain, which is a way of you keeping private control of that, that Bitcoin asset or other cryptocurrency without it being in the control of anyone else. Now, that's great news because effectively you're becoming your own bank. This is the really empowering bit of cryptocurrencies. But there's plenty of stories around in the news, uh, you know, in Canada and here in the, the UK and Europe of people losing their Bitcoin, losing control of their Bitcoin, forgetting power passwords. And I guess that's the downside that, you know, it's quite an empowering thing to be your own bank, but it's also very dangerous because there's no help desk. There's no, you know, there's no one to call up and give you a hand with these things. If you accept that responsibility, then you need to get it right. Otherwise, the, the penalties can be quite severe in terms of losing control of your money. It sounds like people need to do a lot of research before they sort of just take the leap. Um, but that is that is great advice. Now, um, just in about a minute, I have one question before we go to the next commercial. Uh, do, are there places that accept Bitcoin directly as currency or is it sort of like a security where you'd need to you know, sell that asset and then get the cash and use that to, for example, go and buy a pizza? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, um, 
historically over previous years, there's not been much you could do with it. You know, maybe the odd kind of trendy cafe and things like that, but nothing substantive, I guess you might say, um, which leads many to question the utility of, you know, how much use is a currency you can't really use. However, you know, Tesla announced just earlier this year that they're going to allow customers to purchase Tesla cars with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And there are many other types of software platforms, the likes of PayPal, et cetera, and eBay, uh, all who are, who are now offering the opportunity or have said they will offer the opportunity for customers to pay with Bitcoin and other currencies as well. Really fascinating. We're going to get back into it after these commercial messages. Welcome back to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gaen, and we're talking about the rise of cryptocurrencies and sort of the basics of Bitcoin. Um, Professor Brown, can you explain to me what is the main advantage of using Bitcoin instead of a traditional currency or investing in Bitcoin instead of a traditional investment product? I think probably two, two parts to the question. The first one in terms of an investment product, um, obviously we live in an era now where uh, you know, interest rates are incredibly low and central banks are saying they will be lower for longer as well. So, you know, the quest for yield, as investors talk about it, the idea that you can gain a, a significant return from traditional stocks and shares or bonds or whatever else you might be investing is pretty slim pickings at the moment. So the idea of the, the returns which have happened historically with things such as cryptocurrencies are excessive and therefore uh, quite quite appealing to many investors around the world. So that, that that's, the I guess you might say, the first thing. Uh, the second thing is is one really around back, around financial liberty and, and kind of the freedom that, that something like Bitcoin affords you. It does give you the ability to effectively become your own bank. And what this means is, is you know, if I wanted to transfer some money from myself to you, if I transferred a huge amount of money very quickly and it landed in your Canadian bank account, that's going to set up all kinds of triggers, all kinds of potential problems. You might have to account for that money, say where it came from. There's a regulator who's interested. There are uh, tax authorities who are interested. When you do that actually using cryptocurrencies, there is actually, it's very difficult to track. Um, and so a lot of people, for right or for wrong, actually enjoy the anonymity. They enjoy the, the kind of the idea that um, it's not actually subject to um, uh, other parties, such as uh, central banks and their payment intermediaries, but instead they have full control of their own monetary wealth. Um, so that's what derives that extra utility or, or satisfaction from using Bitcoin as a, an alternative payment system, I guess you might say. It ra certainly raises a lot of really um, serious regulatory concerns that we're going to cover off in our follow-up show about, about how crypto is, is regulated. But one of the questions that really fascinates me about these cryptocurrencies is how crazy the world has gone for them. Um, you know, it used to be worth were pennies. I have a friend who um, who was paid so for a volunteer job, and in, he was given two and a half bitcoins years ago, and he kind of forgot that he had them. Now he's he's got over a hundred thousand dollars because he found them. Um, but but what what has happened? What has caused this to happen? Um, is it is this a, a bubble? What what is the behind this bit rush? Yeah, yeah, bit rush is uh, definitely the term, isn't it? I think. The problem with a bubble is that you only tend to be able to identify them with the benefit of hindsight. So, you know, plenty of people talked about the, the sort of late 2017 price spike of about $20,000 as being a bubble. And now we're three times that. So it's, it's, it, you only really can see it after the fact, which makes them hard. Um, one of the, one of the key points of interest, I mean, just to put this into context. Um, so the uh, Bitcoin is now worth about the same as the Swiss franc. It's worth, um, you know, so it's, it's, if we were to rank all global currencies, um, it's 13th in the world. So it ceased to be this kind of periphery asset. It's now, you know, a genuine contender. Uh, you know, it's more than a trillion uh, US dollars in terms of aggregate worth. That's the total price of all Bitcoins added together. Um, in terms of why it's happening, I think there's a few things. The first thing is quantitative easing. So the idea that people and, and nation states globally are creating more money. This is the, the general uh, policy which has been in place as a monetary policy for many nation states. And it's got even worse with something like COVID and before that, the financial crisis. So as we see that expansion of the money supply, a lot of people look at that and see their, their own monetary reserves or wealth actually being worth less in real terms. So an asset such as Bitcoin, which can't actually be manipulated in that same way, is suddenly becomes very attractive to them. Um, so that's probably one of the main ones I would suggest in terms of you know, driving forces, this idea of supply. 
So is it is it accurate that Bitcoin can't be manipulated? Is that really what the advantage is? Because I think one of the concerns has been, um, at least around putting it onto traditional exchanges, is 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 manipulation. Um, is it why is it that you view it as a, a currency or product that can't be manipulated? Yeah, and I guess I should have been more accurate in my words there. But by manipulated, I mean manipulated from its supply. So as we've been talking right now, we've seen two, probably two more Bitcoin blocks be created. Um, so there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. That's the maximum number of Bitcoins there will ever be. So as I said before, you know, when we look at different um, monetary policies around the world, it's typically controlled by central banks, by people, by you know, voting, managing exchange rates, managing the supply of money. As I said before, those things can't be done or certainly very difficult to do in the world of cryptocurrency. So in other words, you're putting your faith in mathematical code and something which is more sure rather than necessarily in people, politicians and currency boards. Well, I certainly understand why people are skeptical of, of how politicians are, are dealing with our markets these days following the financial crisis. Um, we're going to follow up on this question when we come back from these commercial messages. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're doing a special episode on Bitcoin 101. Um, we're joined by Professor uh, Gavin Brown from the University of Liverpool. Now, Professor Brown, I've read about the rise of new digital currencies that are actually state-backed currencies. For example, the Chinese government's come up with one. And uh, we now also know that you know Facebook, which isn't a government, but it is as powerful as some of them, uh, they have their own digital currency as well. Can you, can you talk about those? Yeah, sure. So um, effectively, what we have at the moment is a, a three-way fight or contest for the future of money. Um, so the first contender, if we were to talk about it in those terms, would be um, what you're describing there is something called the CBDC, which stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. So that's certainly what the Chinese are proposing and many other nations around the world as well. Um, effectively, this is a almost a crypto version of their existing currency. So a crypto Canadian dollar or a crypto pound. But this is where the, the, the kind of nation state or the central bank is saying, well, let's try and take some of the advantages of the technology which things like Bitcoin use. But rather than allowing it to be anonymous and kind of on the periphery, we'll actually do it from a state-sponsored perspective. So that's the, that's the first contender. The second one is one of corporate-issued currencies. So this is where large corporations such as Facebook have actually um, committed to launching their own currencies. So these are currencies created by the company, which can be used to um, yeah, within their ecosystem. So on the Facebook platform, you'll be able to move money easily between yourself and contacts, whether that be in WhatsApp, Instagram, or Facebook, for instance. And then the third and final one is what we know is decentralized currency. So that's what Bitcoin would come into. This is the idea of a, a cryptocurrency or a technological digital currency, which isn't controlled by one single person or entity, but is instead controlled by communities. And these communities are what we know as the, as the Bitcoin miners. So that's a, a three-way contest. We've got central banks, we've got corporations, and then we've got the people, if you wish to talk about Bitcoin in those terms. And where are we in this race between these three rising types of currency? And, and where does traditional currency fit into the picture? I mean, who do you think is going to come out on top in this, in this, uh, this battle? Yeah, it's, um, that is certainly the, the $100 billion or maybe $100 you know, billion Bitcoin question. Um, but um, what we've got there is, 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 at the moment, traditional currencies are by far the, the largest, you know, significantly larger than any other. However, they are changing. Like with any type of technological innovation, they are changing. Uh, and there are projects all over the world. There's a, there's a digital dollar project in the US. There's projects in the UK that I'm working with as well. Um, and it's likely that our current uh, monetary system will change to become a more advanced version of what it currently is. It's likely that that will be very prominent, if not the most prominent of all currencies. However, corporations as well are getting bigger uh, every day, um, significantly more power, as you said before in your opening statement. And so it is quite likely that they will have a part to play if they're permitted the regulatory permissions to allow them to actually mint and use their own currencies. There's lots of political pushback on that, particularly against the likes of Facebook. And then finally, uh, things like cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, 
uh, will always have their place, I think. You know, the idea of becoming your own bank is a very empowering one and will always appeal to many people around the globe and have some social good to do as well as some of the downsides which come with that. So I see all three potentially as being as being key players. But for me, I think it's the, the CBDCs versus the uh, the corporate issued currencies is where maybe the key battle might be between corporations and nation states um, with Bitcoin maybe on the sidelines, although still a very good investment in my personal view. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation, Professor Brown, and I want to thank you so much for joining us and, and walking through the basics of what, for many people, uh, myself included, it's a very complex topic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate it. We've heard today about the rise of new digital currency or financial products called Bitcoin and the rush of people who want to get rich buying and selling it. But what do you think? Are cryptocurrencies the new frontier and a product worth putting money into? Or is it too risky an asset with uncertain regulation? Will regulators be able to keep pace with this new technology? Or is decentralization one of the advantages of cryptocurrency? You be the judge. I'm Christine Van Gein, and remember, a freer Canada starts with you. I'm Nima Rajan, and this is the Forum Daily. Join us for our daily news program that brings you the biggest stories of the day from Canada and around the world. The Forum Daily gives you the facts on the issues that matter to Canadians to help you stay informed in an ever-changing world. Join me weekdays for the Forum Daily, 6 p.m., 7.30 p.m., 9 p.m., and 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on the News Forum Network.